Desenvolvimento, Produção e Serviço Mundial, sob o nome. Nós criamos soluções. Nós somos a Rod e Schwartz. Okay, we can start. Hello, uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have the second plenary. Okay, we can start. Hello, Hello. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to have the second plenary. Okay, we can start. We have uh, in Hello. this plenary, uh, we have two speakers. Okay. The first speaker, uh, Professor Oswaldo Simeone, uh, is a professor of information engineering and director of the King's Communication Information Processing and Learning Laboratory and chair of the UK and Ireland chapter of the IEEE Information Theory Society. He received the, an MS uh, a C degree with honors and a PhD degree in information engineering from the Politecnico de Milano. He's an IEEE fellow uh, and is also a lecturer of the Information Theory Society. He's a, he's a distinguished lecturer. And he had uh, some uh, academic positions in the US, Italy, and Denmark. Published more than 100 uh, peer reviewed uh, <clears throat> journal and magazine papers and around 200 peer reviewed uh, conference paper. He's a co author of, of a monograph and an edited book by Cambridge University Press. He was a former editor of the IEEE Transaction Wireless Communications, uh, IEEE Transaction Communication, and IEEE Transaction Information Theory. Is a member of the IEEE Signal Processing for Communication Networking Technical Committee. He is co-recipient of the 2019 IEEE Communication Society Best Tutorial Paper Award, uh, the 2018 IEEE Signal Processing Best Paper Award, 2017 JCN Best Paper Award, and 2015 IEEE Communication Best Paper uh, Best tutorial paper award and the best paper award of the ATP Spoke 2007 and WRE COM 2007. So I invite uh, Professor Simeone to start uh, his uh, plenary talk. Okay. Thank you so much, Marcelo, for the uh, very kind uh, introduction. I am pleased to be here with you. Um, and so this, my talk may be a bit different perhaps with others uh, in the, this event. Um, I'll be talking about an emerging computing technology, uh, neuromorphic uh, computing. And I'll speculate on some possible uses of the technology for communication systems. I'll be assuming that the topic is new, so I'll provide a tutorial overview of the subject. I am happy to take questions during the talk if it's allowed. Otherwise, we can wait until the end. Uh, I'm happy either way. OK, so what I'll discuss is joint work with Harry Young Jung and um, Nicolas Kaczewski, the former postdoc, the former, and a current PhD student in my group. OK, so I'll proceed as follows. First, I'll motivate the, uh, my interest and generally the interest of the community, machine learning community, um, and other communities, scientific communities in neuromorphic computing. I'll describe how the technology works um, from the outside. And then I'll describe how it works from the inside in terms of models and uh, computing models. Um, the applications that I'll be focusing on are concerned machine learning. So I'll also touch upon how these uh, systems are trained. And now again, I'll provide some ideas of how they can be potentially used in communication systems. Uh, 
I may skip some parts in case we run out of time. Run out of time. OK, so motivation. Now, the field of neuromorphic computing may not be new to some of you. In fact, it has been around for some time, ever since the, the 90s, right, work by Carver Mead. But uh, I'll get to that later. But the, it's motivated by the following observation. Um, now, the, uh, the structure, the architecture of artificial neural networks, which underlie deep learning, um, is, of course, reminiscent, was inspired, of course, back in the 50s by the architecture of biological uh, neural networks or brains, in the sense that uh, the architecture consists of simple, relatively simple computing units, which are identical, the neurons. And these neurons are connected with a large fan in and a large fan out into in, an, in a graph of connections. Now, so there is this analogy, but this analogy only goes uh, that far because if you look at how in each individual neuron actually operates, it, it operates quite differently in an artificial neural network, ANN, as compared to a biological neural network, uh, brain. Uh, in, in fact, as you, I'm sure you know, the, um, a neuron in an artificial neural network is a simple static nonlinearity, right? That takes as input, uh, let me point here, takes as inputs um, real numbers, weighs them, sums them up, and then applies some nonlinearity, and out goes another real number. And this is, again, a static operation. A neuron in the brain operates very differently. Um, it is a dynamic system, much more complex system, but most importantly, it's dynamic. And it operates, it takes as input, and it produces as output spiking signals. So signals that are defined by the timing of some spikes, of some action potentials. And so the field of neuromorphic computing is essentially inspired by this question, whether we can, the question of whether we can improve over the capabilities of cognitive systems or machine learning systems for our purposes, um, by trying to mimic more closely the way in which biological neurons work, biological neural networks work, as compared to the abstractions that are used by current artificial neural networks. So that's the general question, whether we can do better by mimicking nature more closely. And the question, in fact, extends not only to computing, but it also extends to sensing. And so if you think about applications to communication systems, to, of course, IoT and uh, network sensors, um, sensors and networks of sensors, uh, in that biological sensors do not produce, you know, frames of bits like the sensors that we have in our communication systems, but again, they operate in a much different way. They are event-driven, and they output spikes, spiking signals, right? again, in which information is encoded in the timing of certain events. Now, again, the, the question was formulated and was studied at the level of hardware design, particularly by Carver Mead in the 90s. And this is a famous cover from Scientific American from uh, May 1991 which shows how a um, silicon retina built in the lab of Carver Mead actually sees the world, the world. It may not be clear from the static picture, but it sees it in terms of spikes, right? And I'll show you a video, in fact, later of how this works. Uh, but again, the point is that this field has been around for some time, tries to tackle this question of whether biological um, plausibility can be useful also to improve cognitive capabilities of machine learning systems. And it has uh, acquired renewed interest in recent years. And this is mostly because of the successes, but also the limitations of deep learning. All right, so if you compare a state-of-the-art uh, deep learning-driven artificial agent, like a drone, for instance, maybe trained using reinforcement learning, to a counterpart biological agent, and you compare them in terms of uh, capabilities and in terms of resources they need to, to operate, you'll see that the gap is huge. Right? Uh, a biological being can adapt, can flexibly modify its operation, and it does so with much smaller footprint in terms of power, orders of magnitude less, and in terms of weight, so space. Um, so there is a huge gap to be bridged. And so the promise of the technology is that by trying to move closer to biology, we can also bridge this gap to some extent. And of course, the 
uh, this question is becoming more and more and more important as the amount of resources needed by conventional technologies, uh, artificial neural network technologies increases, and it's increasing exponentially, as, as you certainly heard. Now, if we were able to have a technology that can learn and carry out inference control in a more energy efficient manner, by again mimicking the way in which uh, biological systems work, then this would open up a whole, a whole host of new applications, most notably at the level of mobile, um, you know, mobile computing, applications of machine learning systems or mobile, um, mobile devices. And again, this can open up potentially new, you know, new applications such as you know, neural prosthetics, where you may have very small devices that are battery powered and that have to operate in a continual, always on fashion while adapting to you know, data that is observed over time. Okay, so again, the, the topic is acquiring and renewed interest for the reasons I explained. And what we have right now, and there has been significant progress in the last few years, what we have right now are a pretty large number of harder platforms that are neuromorphic in the sense that they make some steps they make uh, some steps towards biological plausibility. And the main step that has been taken so far is to incorporate a neuronal model that works using spikes. So instead of, again, using those static models that I described before, this cl new class of chips, neuromorphic chips, uses spike-based dynamic event-driven processing. Um, and these type of networks are known as spiking neural networks, or SNNs. Okay, so we have algorithms to some extent, but again, all these uh, harder platforms that implement spiking neural networks in which the neurons are replaced, the, you know, the static neurons of deep learning are replaced with these dynamic spiking-based uh, systems. And the fact that uh, you know, uh, engineers have decided to implement spikes as the first feature uh, in this quest to mimic biology is in fact well justified by neuroscience in that in neuroscience, it is argued that spikes are an essential component of the way the brain works because they can encode information very efficiently in the timing of their spike. They can uh, communicate with low latency, right? Because as soon as a, an important event happens, it can be encoded in the timing of a spike and this can be propagated to the recipient. Um, and they can also travel far and they can operate the low SNR as we know from, you know, important, uh, for instance, results in information theory. Okay, so again, there are chips that implement spiking neural networks. There are quite a large number of them. Uh, in this chart, you'll see that um, uh, there are some systems that try to just mimic the brain. So the goal of these systems is neuroscientific just to give us a tool to study the brain, but others, which are mo more interest for, for us as engineers, uh, are instead uh, designed to carry out cognitive uh, uh, tasks, you know, like, like conventional accelerators for deep learning. And there are, again, quite a large number of them. Some of them are fully digital, and some of them incorporate also analog uh, components, uh, particularly systems that use memoristic devices, or so these new uh, memory uh, systems. Um, of all these systems, some are uh, produced by startups, and uh, there is a healthy ecosystem of startups that uh, produce um, both uh, neuromorphic sensing uh, systems and also computing systems, the chips I just alluded to. Um, so here is a timeline of some of the funding that I'm aware of. And um, there are also major players like IBM and Intel in this field. And Intel, in fact, released, I think just this week, the new chip, which is called Loihi2, the new neuromorphic chip Loihi2. You can, you can check it out in uh, some recent uh, press releases. Now, um, I presented neuromorphic computing indeed as implementing, you know, spike-based event-driven computing. And I also alluded to the fact that these chips um, have other features. And one of the key features that they have is that they, most of them, that they carry out in-memory computing. So um, 
uh, instead of following you know the standard von Neumann architecture of computing where memory is separate from processing in these systems memory and computing are integrated and so the very same elements that store uh, you know memory so for instance synaptic weights of a neural network are also the elements that compute okay so in in some works you may also find the term neuromorphic uh, refer only to you know to all systems that have in memory computing but here i'm taking the i think the more common definition of the term that also includes a spiking aspect right so neuromorphic systems are also spiking uh, implement spiking neural networks now because we have this hardware at hand now uh, there have been a number of studies that, which are ongoing and uh, by no means concluded that have tried to assess to what extent neuromorphic computing platforms can improve over more conventional solutions such as you know CPU, GPUs, and you know, classical uh, classical platforms. And again, the, the, the a full understanding is still out. I mean, it's still to be achieved, but there are a few things that can be said. The first thing to be said is that you we don't want to use neuromorphic computing to improve just accuracy. You know, if you're after the accuracy on some you know ImageNet large data set, that's not what the technology is for. The technology is for is to improve the efficiency with which the certain levels of accuracy are achieved. So uh, the way these results are obtained in this chart, which is taken from a report by Intel, uh, is that you fix some level of accuracy that is you know, acceptable. And then you try to find out how much time and how much energy is needed to obtain that particular result. And so this chart shows uh, time and energy for fixed accuracy. So kind of reversing the conventional approach in machine learning of just showing, you know, some percentage improvement in terms of accuracy. And what you see here is that there are quite a large number of problems that have been found in which neuromorphic computing can provide significant advantages in terms of efficiency, orders of magnitude improvement, both in terms of energy and latency. These applications, which are, you know, I'm not going to go over them, but uh, you can read them here. Um, involve learning problems, some learning problems, but also some optimization routines, like solving lasso, you know, uh, sparse regression problems, for instance. OK. OK, so that's a uh, short motivation, right, as to why um, neuromorphic computing is of interest. And there is you know, a lot of activity by different communities, machine learning, hardware design, Neuroscience, of course, although they, the focus there is, is different. So what I'd like to do next is to describe how such systems can work from the outside. So what's the, how, you know, what the operation of the system looks like. So as I said, uh, neuromorphic systems implement spiking neural networks, SNNs. And the spiking neural networks, if you look them from outside, from the point of view of input-output interface, what they do is they take as input spiking signals. A spiking signal is a matrix, uh, as you can see here, in which each row of this matrix is identified by the timings of spikes. Right? So you have one spiking signal is a collection of times. So you can represent it with a list of times. And uh, you generally have as input a number of such signals, which can, of course, be streaming. They're usually streaming in. So as you know, time goes on, spikes are produced by whatever is attached to this SNN, and the SNN is there to process these spikes. And at the output, the SNN also typically produces spikes, so spiking signals. Now, how do you attach this machine to the rest of the world? There are two main ways to do it. The first way, the most natural, not always the most uh, realistic, depending on the application, is to attach a neuromorphic sensor on the one end and a neuromorphic actuator on the other end. A neuromorphic sensor is just a sensor that produces spikes. And the neuromorphic actuator is an actuator that uses spikes to carry out, for instance, some task. It could be, for instance, there are some robotic arms that you know, take as input spikes and uh, act accordingly. Now, the field of neuromorphic sensing is, in fact, quite rich. I mentioned earlier that there are startups and uh, you, know, you can easily buy neuromorphic sensors at this point, then 
the um, the industry that is most most developed at the moment, there are several uh, companies in this field, is that of neuromorphic cameras. So, a neuromorphic camera is a camera that differs from conventional, you know, frame-based uh, digital cameras in that a neuromorphic camera produces a spike for each pixel only when the luminance of that pixel changes by more or less than a certain amount. So essentially what these cameras do is that they produce nothing. There is no information coming out. If the image is static, there is nothing happening. And they produce spikes only when things happen, when you know, there is some, something of relevance that happens at the you know, different pixels. So you can imagine these cameras are very useful for applications like, say, drone monitoring. So you have a camera that needs to monitor an area. Not much happens in that area most of the time, but every once in a while, you have you know, an unwanted object passing through, and you want to recognize it and raise an alarm. All well, these systems essentially consume no energy until something happens. And at that point, they produce some spikes to indicate that, you know, to you know, encode the information about uh, these objects that are changing the luminance of the pixels. So um, yeah, these neuromorphic cameras, for instance, this is an example of how they look like. We have one of these, uh, for instance, in my group to, uh, to do some experiments. And the type of signals that you get out of it look something like this, right? So here is somebody playing air guitar. And you see here that the uh, background is completely gone. All that you see are spikes, positive or negative in this case, depending on whether luminance increases or decreases, when movement uh, occurs when movement takes place. So this is the best way, in, in the mo most efficient way to use neuromorphic systems. If you have a neuromorphic sensor and a neuromorphic actuator, the interfaces are seamless. Um, if instead the, uh, you'd like to use neuromorphic systems uh, in the context of uh, sensors that produce natural signals like images, videos, sound, and on the other hand, side, you have an actuator that also wishes to receive uh, a natural signal, like you know, some specific uh, decision, for instance, in a classification problem. Then there is a need to convert from natural signals to spikes and back. And this can be done in various ways. And it's a well-studied problem in, uh, in neuroscience, albeit still kind of not fully resolved. And there are two kind of main ways to, to do that that are used in practice. The first way is to use rate encoding. So rate encoding means that the information is encoded in how many spikes are produced, right? So let's say you have an image. You want to convert it into spikes so you can give it to an SNN. So you want, one thing you can do is that for every pixel, you have one spiking signal. Right, one sequence of spikes. And the more spikes you have, the brighter the pixel, or vice versa. This is one way to do it. This way is not very efficient, because you may need a lot of spikes if you want to represent signals with granularity, with sufficient granularity. And so another approach that is much more efficient is to use time encoding. In time encoding, the information, let's say the lumin luminosity, the luminance of uh, the brightness of a uh, of a pixel is encoded in the timing of a spike and not in the number of spikes. And so this can be much, much more efficient because with one or few spikes, you can <clears throat> uh, encode a large number of, of you know, signal levels, for instance. So modern uses of neuromorphic technology prefer to use um, time encoding, although time encoding is more difficult, of course, to optimize for as you probably can imagine. OK, so we understand now you know, how you can embed an SNN into a system. Either you know, the sensors in the actuator are neuromorphic, or if they're not, you need to convert between spikes and the real world. Uh, once you have that in place, you can use an SNN in principle for anything for which you can use also an ANN, an artificial neural network, in that uh, SNNs can be used you know, for can be trained, can be optimized to do inference, control. And of course, if uh, provided with data, they can learn. And in fact, the, uh, one of the key selling points of SNNs is that unlike ANNs, you know, deep learning type of systems, 
once you deploy an SNN, at least the most modern uh, system, the most modern computing platforms, what they can do is that they can adapt online. They can keep adapting their operation, their synaptic weights. And this is in definite, in definite contrast with most, at least as far as I can, as far as I know, accelerators for ANNs, which once you know deployed, they are deployed and they are, and then they cannot be changed unless you know one stops and maybe um, goes back to the cloud and uh, retrains the system uh, anew. Okay, and I think it's quite useful to stress that it is not claimed by anyone that the neuromorphic computing will just replace uh, deep learning and artificial neural network altogether. It is a complementary technology in some way that covers a different application space. And Intel recently uh, released um, an interesting, and I think quite accurate uh, list of specifications that an application is expected to have in order to benefit from neuromorphic computing. And I'm just going to go over some of these points because I think it's important to understand this is not panacea, right? Uh, uh, universal solution, but it you know, tackles specific problems. So first of all, the, you expect the application to have streaming input, to be an application in which the system is always on and keeps receiving streaming data. Think again about the drone monitoring um, uh, setting. There should be a need for adaptation. So for instance, in the drone monitoring scenario, perhaps you know, malicious agents are using drones that use some camouflage or try to hide themselves. And so you need to keep adapting to changing conditions. So th there should be that as well. Um, there is uh, a need for low latency responses. Again, in the monitoring scenario, you want to act quickly uh, as soon as something is um, revealed as informative or dangerous potentially, right? Depending on the application. Uh, typically you want the application to be power constrained um, in that these systems by using spikes try to mimic again the, the way in which the brain works, which is much more efficient than, um, than conventional systems because it is again, operates in this sparse uh, event driven fashion. And finally there are two main corners of the application space that can be covered by neuromorphic computing. In one, which is, I think, the most interesting, uh, especially for, you know, for, for us working in communication, is uh, mobile devices. So small devices which have limited data, they solve small scale problems that have to be carried out locally. There is also another corner, which is kind of the opposite, where uh, one has enough uh, Invest, the initial investment to uh, build a system that uses in-memory computing, which is more expensive than a system that uses conventional von Neumann architecture. And then this architecture is used for high throughput and um, you know, for efficiency at runtime, right? And so the, it's a large scale system that is expensive because memory elements are more expensive than compute elements. Uh, and then, so the initial investment is large, but then later on, the uh, uh, the efficiency at runtime is worth the initial effort. Okay, so these are you know some points to keep in mind when thinking about this technology. And what I what I wanted to do next is to provide some technical details of how internally uh, SNNs work, so these neuromorphic systems work, and how they're trained. Okay, so as as you know, you know as I mentioned also at the beginning. A neural network and also a spike neural network is a collection of nodes, a collection of neurons, which are connected through a graph that defines the interconnectivity of these neurons. And um, so in SNNs, you can generally, you can have pretty general connectivity architectures, not necessarily layered, for instance. And you know, when you see an arrow going from one neuron to another, that means that spikes that this neuron produces are received by this other neuron with some delay. And so this other neuron here, which is known as postsynaptic neuron, it receives the spike from the presynaptic neuron and changes its, its internal state and you know, its operation, right? It's, its spiking behavior. 
So uh, typically you can distinguish between neurons that are visible and, and neurons that are hidden. This is true also for you know, deep learning, artificial neural network. The visible neurons are the neurons that are connected to the outside world, like I showed before. And the hidden neurons are the ones that are inside the SNN and their behavior is there just to facilitate uh, some desired input-output uh, behavior. Now, the um, spiking neural networks are typically implemented in discrete time. In neuroscience, people prefer continuous time, but in the implementations that, um, that I mentioned earlier, time is typically discrete. However, importantly, um, time is not uh, run by a clock. So these chips typically do not have a clock, which makes them more efficient also for that reason. Uh, the way in which they keep a common time scale is by means of consensus mechanisms. So the way it works is that after uh, neurons have completed operation at step t minus one, they communicate to other neurons that they are ready for step t, and step t is started when uh, you know neurons have reached a consensus that it's time to do so. So because time is discrete, at each time each neuron either spikes, so it emits a one, and that takes energy to be communicated, or instead it's silent, and in that case, no energy essentially is consumed. So the idle energy of these systems is very, very, very low. Okay, so now, um, how does each neuron actually work, right? So in neuroscience, of course, there are many models of, um, of you know, the operation of the neuron, and um, the work on SNNs is, of course, inspired by those models. But the models that are typically implemented in these chips are much simpler than the most sophisticated um, models that you read about in, uh, in the neuroscience literature. Uh, for instance, there was a recent study, maybe last week, that showed that if you wanted to reproduce one of these neuroscientific models, you would have to use a pretty large neural network right, with many neurons to make it work. Um, so the models that are implemented are quite simple, but they're still dynamic and they're spike-based, and they can be of two different kinds. There are models that are deterministic, and these are the most uh, common ones, the most common models. In my group, we have been uh, working on probabilistic models um, uh, for reasons that I'll, I'll, I'll get to later. So there are these two types of models, deterministic and probabilistic. Uh, in, uh, in both cases, the each neuron again, is a dynamic stateful system, which has a state, an internal state, and this state is known as membrane potential. And this membrane potential evolves over time as a function of the spikes that the neuron receives. And in a deterministic model, which is known as spike response model, this is a standard type of model that you find implemented, whenever the membrane potential crosses a threshold, then a spike is emitted, and, uh, you know, and then the membrane potential goes down again. In, uh, prob in probabilistic models, instead, the, uh, the probability of emitting a spike depends on how far the membrane potential is from a threshold. So you can have a spiking spike even when the threshold has not been crossed, but the probability of spiking gets larger as you get closest to, closer to the threshold. So that, now, how does the membrane potential evolve? I won't make the story very long, but essentially, the membrane potential of a neuron, let's say a postsynaptic neuron that I represent here, depends on the spikes that have been received from the presynaptic neurons, so from the neurons that are attached to this neuron, and also depends on the spikes of the neuron itself. And so the way it works is that every spike from a presynaptic neuron elicits a response. This is why this type of models are known as uh, spike response models. So it elicits a response, which decays over time. And so as a result of the spikes from the presynaptic neurons, you have a trace of responses, which looks like you know, a convolution of the spikes with the response of the synapse. And all these traces are summed up with some weights that one can train, can optimize. And this determines the... Um, the evolution of the membrane potential. Remember, these are dynamic systems. And there is also a mechanism by which 
if a neuron is, emits a spike, this spike also affects its own membrane potential. And this essentially is done so as to avoid that a neuron spikes too often. So whenever a neuron spikes, that spike uh, decreases the membrane potential. And this makes sure that the neuron can control the rate at which it spikes. OK, so as you, as, as you have seen in this chart, uh, SNNs have some parameters that can be optimized, which are these weights, just like conventional artificial neural networks. And so one of the key problems is how we, um, we train, so we optimize these weights. So there are three main ways to do that. The first way that you know, has been used in uh, a lot of works, but I think by now is becoming less uh, uh, desirable, is to first train an ANN. You use you know, TensorFlow or whatever software library. You train an, SNN, an ANN, conventional deep learning network, or learn artificial neural network, and then you convert the weights to an SNN. And that's typically done so that the spike rate of the spike in neurons is close to the real numbers that are output by the ANN. So this type of approach is not pre preferred right now because it's kind of limited to rate encoding. And as I mentioned before, rate encoding is quite inefficient. There are also some methods based on time encoding, but they're quite limited. So I think this approach is not pre preferred. And also the main issue, another main issue is that it does not allow for online learning, right? You have to do this offline. The other two ways instead enable direct training of SNNs. The, the, the second approach is to do training on software and then of an SNN directly, not uh, converting it from an ANN, and then implementing those weights on hardware. The third way is to directly implement learning on chip. And one of the key uh, features of these chips like Loihi, Intel's Loihi, is that they do enable adaptation on the chip, so online continual learning right, on the chip. But one thing that should be pointed out and stressed is that they do that quite differently from conventional neural networks. So you may know that in conventional neural networks, backprop, backpropagation is the way to train. So that requires passing data through a network and then going back, okay, stopping everything, going back through the same network to compute the gradients. Right? So there are these two phases, and this does not enable really efficient uh, learning on hardware, particularly in an online fashion. So learning on your morphic hardware is instead based on um, local rules. So in, um, in this type of systems, the, um, the changes that are made to the synaptic weights are done in such a way that it only depends on information that the synapse has during the forward pass without requiring the ba any backward pass, essentially. So these changes can be done as data is processed. So one of the key challenges in neuromorphic computing is to develop algorithms that, that are local, right? that can be implemented on this hardware by just using local steps. So I won't make this story very long. I can get into the details if there are questions. But the, this challenge is typically handled in you know, one or two ways. The first way is to take a deterministic model, like I mentioned before, and essentially approximate backpropagation. So make various changes, approximations to backpropagation in such a way that it becomes local. And so this typically requires uh, truncations and uh, using some surrogate functions and some uh, you know, approximations of backpropagation. I won't get into the details. I can. Definitely answer questions if you have any uh, later. Um, so approximations of backprop. Um, the other approach which we have been taking in our group is to use randomness. So if you implement instead of a deterministic neuron model, a probabilistic neuron model, it turns out that all those approximations are not necessary. You can obtain local rules directly by optimizing uh, the likelihood, the, the likelihood that the output is, uh, you know, as desired, uh, according, uh, basically compliant with the data that you have access to. So it turns out that you can directly develop 
local learning rules by leveraging randomness. And the key idea here is that, um, why is randomness useful? Randomness is useful in some way because it allows you to explore the space of synoptic parameters. And by doing that, uh, you don't need to do backpropagation. And so you can trade randomness for the need of backpropagation. And um, so one interesting question that we've been exploring is, um, and again, I'm skipping these technical details in the interest of time, uh, is what is the comparison between these two approaches, right? So to make uh, schemes, uh, training schemes local, we have to make either approximations, if we use these deterministic models, or we, we need to use these probabilistic models that you know uh, can directly account for these constraints. Um, so we have done, of course, a number of experiments to compare these different techniques. And one of the experiments I want to just point out here, so, um, this is a classification task. So you probably know the MNIST data set. So what, what was done here is to show images from an MNIST data set to a neuromorphic camera. So the neuromorphic camera looks at uh, images of neuromorphic, of, uh, sorry, of uh, MNIST handwritten digits producing spikes. And these spikes are processed by an SNN and we want to classify we want to distinguish whether you know a digit is one to nine or zero to nine. Okay, so um, so we have compared the performance of these deterministic models that are based on various approximations and probabilistic models, and what we found is uh, again you know don't worry about all these uh, names that th this part here the table corresponds to the deterministic models, and this one here to these probabilistic models that use randomness. And what we saw is that as you decrease the size of the network, right? So decrease the number of neurons here. And these are the number of neurons that we have. Uh, and as you also decrease the time resolution, so the the uh, the speed at which the signals are passed through the network, deterministic models tend to uh, way, lose performance very very quickly. So they're not very efficient in the use of resources. Right. As soon as they have limited resources, because of all those approximations that they do, uh, they tend to lose accuracy very quickly. Whereas if you use a probabilistic model, which inherently tries to capture the noisiness right, the, in the, that arises from the limitations that you have in the resources that you have access to, then the performance remains almost unchanged. So, I mean, to a certain extent, of course. So this seems to point to the fact that these probabilistic models are uh, potentially uh, you know, a solution of choice when uh, working with small models, limited data, in which accounting for these levels of uncertainty is important. OK, the last thing I wanted to say quickly is uh, I mentioned already one application to communication systems, of course, which is you know, machine learning on mobile devices. I wanted to mention another one that we've been working on in my group. Uh, this is, you know, less obvious application, I think. So to explain it, consider a uh, setting where you have devices that collect data. These are mobile devices that are battery powered. And they, you know, they continually sense data. So they're always on, right? And they stream data to another mobile device, which whose goal is to make sense of this data, to, to, do, to carry out some inferences. And this is also a battery power device. So a conventional way to implement the system would be to, of course, have an all digital system, right? So you have a sensor, the sensor is digital, so it produces bits in frames. These frames are processed by a CPU. They are encoded using some digital uh, communication technology. These bits are sent uh, through the, you know, the smartphone looking device in the previous slide and the, on the other side, Again, you have a digital chain from you know, receiver to, uh, to classifier, for instance, or anyway, to inference machine. Now, the problem with this, with this architecture is that if it is you know, to be working always on, the system may be quite, quite inefficient because as we were discussing before in the example of you know, a drone monitoring system, 
to be you know always on in this type of systems that operate in frames and in a synchronous way can be quite you know expensive in terms of energy consumption it can also be uh, challenging in terms of latency because again these systems need to package information into frames these frames have to be processed and so on and so forth so there is some redundancy there that can create latency so a solution we have been exploring in my group is to replace everything uh, with neuromorphic components so basically do away with bits completely there are no bits there are only spikes so the sensor becomes neuromorphic like a neuromorphic camera the uh, encoder so the you know the processing of the transmitter is done with an SNN in a joint source channel coding fashion. So by producing directly inputs that are sent on the channel, on the channel we can directly transmit spikes. We can use impulse radio, ultra wideband transmission, and just send spikes on the channel. And on the other side, we can directly process the spikes using another SNN. So everything is event-driven, spike-based, and Clearly, the system has the potential to improve the problems, to solve the problems that I mentioned before in terms of energy and latency for the very reasons that motivate uh, neuromorphic uh, computing. And I think it's also interesting to see a synergy here between neuromorphic computing and uh, you know, terahertz and millimeter wave communications, which, which are expected to be central to, to 6G. Uh, in that these are very high bandwidth systems in which pulse-based transmission is one of the possible solutions of choice. So it seems to me that there is some interesting synergy to explore there for this type of applications. I, I mentioned in passing that uh, Ericsson has, as far as I know, been working with Intel on this solution after you know, our paper was published. So there has been some industrial uptake of the idea, as far as I know. And uh, I just wanted to show you why this system may be a good idea. So I won't get into the details of the setting, but it's, again, similar to the previous setting of classifying binary, you know, uh, handwritten digits. And what we did here is to compare. So we, we set up a system where, again, there is this sensor. The sensor observes an input. Um, over time, this axis is time. And here is the accuracy of the receiver at the end of the communication chain in classifying these images. You can think of you know, uh, a, um, the accuracy of the receiver in detecting whether it is a drone or not. Okay. So the system is very, very low SNR. So if you just use a conventional system that you know, transmits whatever the neuromorphic sensor picks up uncoded, the system is completely useless. It gives a probability of error of 50%. So it's no better than guessing. If you use a standard uh, frame-based system, the problem is that you need to wait until enough frames have been received. So it takes time. After enough frames have been received, the system starts making progress and the accuracy goes up. If you use the system that I discussed, you know, fully neuromorphic, then as soon as uh, signals, uh, informative signals are received, the accuracy starts going up. Okay, you can look at one of these two curves. Okay, the accuracy starts going up, and it keeps gracefully going up as more and more and more information is received. And again, when no, there is nothing in, in the scene of interest, this system would just be quiet and consume no energy uh, whatsoever. OK, so in conclusion, I hope that I motivated um, the, you know, the use of neuromorphic computing as, uh, as a technology that can, can complement deep learning for some computing applications. And also, you know, hopefully you find my speculations on applications to communication systems of some interest. I would like to conclude with this chart, which I think is interesting. Um, you know, digital communication has, of course, evolved alongside digital computing ever since you know the early days of Shannon and uh, the transistor and you know these days there are two computing technologies that are emerging you know, there's quantum neuromorphic computing they both uh, I think um, uh, cover different parts of 
you know, the problem domain, right? They, they tackle different types of applications that are useful for different types of problems. And there has been definitely some work on, uh, you know, on defining uh, uses of quantum computing for communication systems from, you know, quantum key distributions to the quantum internet. And I think the work on neuromorphic computing and neuromorphic communication systems is very much still at its infancy. But uh, as I try to motivate in this work, I think there is interesting um, work to be done there, particularly in the fe in fields like industrial IoT or in general uh, sensor networks. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude and I'll be happy to take any questions. If you're still there. Uh, it was an, an enlightening uh, talk, uh, very, very interesting. Uh, I, I think we have uh, one or uh, two questions. Let me check here. Sure. Uh, uh, Alexandre Cavalcante, he asked if it is possible to use the SNN to encrypt data. Can you mm. tell us? about applications to cryptography mm. yeah um to the best of my knowledge the you know maybe even conventional deep learning you know cryptography works quite different right it works in a different type of algebra so i wouldn't say that this is an obvious application uh, but perhaps some you know some simple masking um so, I mean, another question to be asked maybe is uh, if um, if one can obtain, um, if one can guarantee things like differential privacy uh, in training SNNs. Uh, th th that's an interesting question, I think. In terms of cryptography, I'm, I, I would answer no, uh, in the sense that I think the, the primitives that are needed in cryptography are quite different from those that are implemented by these type of systems? Uh, I'd like to, to ask a question. Uh, I, I think we have just a few minutes left, but uh, I, th I think this the, the whole idea of the neuromorphic uh, computing is, is, is very interesting. Yeah, it's uh, like mimicking the, how the brain works and everything. And But I, I'm, I'm interested in one point of your talk at, at the stochastic nature of, of the, the neural network. If you see this as uh, coming in the, the next few years uh, to the industry, because you mentioned that some, some, uh, some of the problems that can be solved of the, uh, with the, the use of a stochastic uh, process. Yeah. Huh? Yes, I mean, if you ask my opinion, um, yes, I think it's coming. And one of the reasons I, I think that's the case is because, um, as I showed in the preview, you know, one of the previous charts, some of these chips are analog, right? And these are the most efficient. They're still prototypes, right? But uh, a lot of these chips are analog, and they use um, uh, memory technologies, analog memory technologies that are noisy because they are, you know, nanoscale devices. There are noisy devices, and this is one of the key challenges that these devices have. That uh, you know they're noisy, so they're unreliable if you view them, uh, you know, in a as implementing a deterministic processor. But if you view them as implementing a stochastic uh, computing machine, then in fact that noise is useful, right? Because you can uh, you can uh, repurpose it to do things like sampling to implement stochastic. Uh, neuronal models. So the point I'm trying to make here is that I think the use of these analog platforms would be uh, instrumental in um, shifting the attention to stochastic models, which can directly use this randomness instead of just trying to mitigate it. And uh, so this is something I'm trying to work on with some colleagues in uh, hardware design. And there are already some studies in this direction some extent, there are some papers that use uh, the, noise, the noise in these devices to do things like Monte Carlo sampling. Um, so there is some work ongoing there, and 
my hope is that uh, it will become more widespread as uh, you know as these platforms become more common at the moment i should stress that uh, the most common most uh, advanced uh, neuromorphic platform is loihi which is fully digital that's intel's platform so that's fully digital and there is no it's very difficult to get randomness in that type of system so i am talking about kind of the gen next generation or maybe after that of uh, this type of technology okay i think we have one more question here uh is there any free and accessible virtual platform or simulator we can use to work with neuromorphic learning yeah there, there is so um one uh, the most popular one is called nengo it's a library um you can find it it's uh, from a company applied brain research but it's free and uh, also intel I think at this point, the SDK for Intel can be found free online. So you can access it, you can use it. There is an emulator. Uh, and some of it integrates also this Nengo library that I mentioned. So yeah, these are the, I think, industry standards at the moment. And there are also several other libraries for Python that you can find online by different groups. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we don't have uh, uh, more time to, to continue the discussion. I, I'd like to thank you very much for you very much, your thank talk. You. It was a very interesting talk, a uh, very new topic uh, on the research market. <laughs> and I think the, the students will profit uh, certainly from your speech and, and uh, I hope uh, you can can uh, can uh, maybe inspire uh, some theses and other things okay. that could do. If uh, anyone has any questions or would like to get in touch, you can just send me an email. I'd be happy to. Yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah, if someone has a question, he can ask you directly. Thank you very much, Professor Thank Simeone. You very much, uh, okay. Bye, and myself. see you later. See I, you. I have Bye. to to invite the new speaker. Uh, the, the second uh, talk at this plenary session will be given uh, by uh, Bosco Eduard Fernandes. Uh, he's a, a well-learned uh, engineer in this area. He has a diploma engineer degree in electrical engineering from uh, the University of Munich and holds a, an executive MBA. He is head of utility smart grid and the smart metering at Huawei. Uh, he, he's been uh, uh, at Huawei Technologies Dusseldorf uh, and, and CEO of communication consultancy. Uh, he, he had uh, held various manager and engineering positions in research and development in circuit and packet circuit, circuit systems and uh, at Siemens. Uh, he served as a uh, responsible manager for a number of uh, GSM projects. Uh, he switched on the first uh, GSM network in the world. That's quite interesting. And the first GSM network uh, outside Europe. He was the former chair of the mobile and personal communication domain in the European research program for uh, three years. and was the mandated chairman of the UMTS test, test force that preceded the creation of the UMTS farm. He has a, a long experience, a, very, a number of uh, years of experience in data and GSCM implementation, network deployment. Uh, so he uh, has a, a vast curriculum uh, in the area. So we will going to profit from the speech of uh, Bosco Fernandes, my dear friend. Uh, the stage is yours. Marcelo, for the introduction and then the kind words. It's been a long time since we've gone through all of these different uh, networks and different possibilities that we've seen grow very easily. Uh, I enjoyed the previous talk from Oswaldo. I thought it was very interesting and shows a lot of future. I've decided to give you a presentation on 
something which is close to reality, showing you the way it has evolved and how things are going to change then in the future. So I, I'm really hoping uh, my presentation can be taken on. I'm not familiar with the system, but uh, I'm trying my best to switch it on. So I really hope it works. Uh, can you see it or can I get some feedback? Somehow or the other? Can uh, someone take it over? Okay. Uh, not yet. Uh, you can press the button share. Oh, wait, wait, so, okay, wait, just a minute, just a minute. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, yeah, okay, share. Share, uh, share screen. Yes. And what do I do now? Okay. At the moment, <clears throat> can you see it? <clears throat> can you see my screen? Okay, not, not yet. Okay. I can see it now, but I have to open it somehow or the other. What do I do? Let, let me see. Um, okay, when, when you... You press share screen. You need to to choose the screen you want to to share, and then you need to to confirm. Now. Yes. Yes. I, yes. It's okay. It's okay. You can see me. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Is it okay? Okay. Okay. So you can see the screen, right? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I do apologize for this little mess up. I'm not familiar with the system. This is the first time I'm using it, but I think it's very interesting. And there's always something new to learn. So this is where we get started. And the talk today is close to the reality, as I pointed out before. Uh, <clears throat> what I'm trying to do is, is really show you where it all came from how important wireless is and where it's going to be in the future. Uh, although it's very close to kind of deployments and where it will have deployments in the future, I will also highlight areas of research where it's very important to do some more work. And uh, <clears throat> not only the industry can fulfill these, these points, but I think uh, it's also very important for students and uh, other locations to be able to contribute, okay? So the first thing is really the drivers. <clears throat> As usual, there are always key drivers. And I think one very good example that we've had so far uh, is the, the COVID-19 pandemic area. A lot of people at this period of time started working at home because they had no other possibility. <clears throat> so they had to go online. In the past, <clears throat> as these networks were being deployed, people said, okay, wireless is a way to get to the remote areas. Very important, it had to give you the bandwidth. The bandwidth and the speeds had to be fulfilled. But in this COVID situation, all of a sudden, people were working from homes virtual schooling came up as a commodity and people are expecting to have better capabilities of accessing any type of information. This showed how weak the wireless systems are to the extent that they couldn't deliver a lot of bandwidth and the speeds that, are, that were required for these homes when there were four and five members in the family trying to access uh, entertainment, educational points, and even business aspects. So it just points out how important the social environment is and as a key 
indicator as to where the constraining of a lockdown situation could really lead to. Communications is a solution, but we're not there. This has also led to other <clears throat> activities where fast growing sorry, systems. Sorry, Bosco, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I think this slide is not a passing. It's only on the first slide. Maybe the, the presentation is on the other screen of your computer. Uh, we just see the, the PowerPoint window. Wait, wait, let me go back. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <clears throat> Maybe you can use the, the PowerPoint mode and pass the slides. We, we can see. We are seeing now. You can you see. Can use, yes, you can use this way. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the help. No problem. No problem. Okay, so I went through this, the basic points of, of really, you know, the importance of having uh, a powerful network in place to meet the requirements of a larger users at the same time connectivity at the same period of time. And just to carry on, the industry and the governments around the world have not really or have failed to deliver the true broadband that they've always promised in the past. And that's why we've had a lot of disruptive technologies that have erupted. And the vertical businesses <clears throat> that are looking towards the future have been suffering from this whole situation. So the crunch has been very hard on them. And we've been looking forward as researchers, as part of the industry towards smart cities, transport networks, automotive and other capabilities, or even applications. And this has to be fulfilled through a very powerful network. The unified structure as such is ready for multi tendency and supposed to need a substantial and scalable network, which has to be imperative. 5G has promised a lot of capabilities, but it's still growing and needs to meet the demand. <coughs> so can you see the next slide? Is the next slide okay? Yes, it's okay. Okay, so the synergies of evolution. They're all about Gs, okay? Just as we've seen we have in the past, the one, two, and three, and the four Gs have all evolved in technologies. It's always been hardware that has been dictating what needs to be pushed forward. Telecom's offers have been striking, for example, for the rapid and the electronic evolution or revolution that has taken place over a number of decades. It takes 15 years for the research, 10 years to get it put in place. So each generation of these technology has been bringing in improvements in capabilities of its pre-successor, but in terms of hardware and hardware improvements. The first two generations were very close to common voice networks and telephone networks. So kind of fixed with a bit of wireless on it and a modem attached for data. It was not enough. Later on, as we moved on, we had to upgrade a lot of these networks to be able to cope for the internet, which was moving much faster than the telecoms networks. And we came in with a 3G environment. The 3G environment brought in for the first time email and a few other um, applications from the internet. <clears throat> when we came to the 4G environment, it became interesting because with the 4G environment, all of a sudden, it had to be an infrastructure opening out doors to broadband uh, apps social networks, video streaming, and all kinds of new things that were showing the real business model of these networks. The architecture had to be changed, still in terms of hardware, to, to cope with these networks. It couldn't just be a telecoms model, it had to move on to something else. 
And in due course, what we're going to see is we're going to upgrade from 5G to something called 6G. <clears throat> the question here is really, is 5G the basis? And is 5G going to be the last G? Or are we going to see another G? And is 6G going to be the end of the Gs? Or will it still carry on? This presentation, what I will do is I will try to present to you and show you the importance of the different networks, the reasoning for going this way, <clears throat> and why it was done. So 5G was designed to be the first truly software-defined wireless standard, where network functions could be simultaneously spun off, new frequency bands could quickly be programmed into the future visions of 5G networks. 5G was supposed to be the real time sharing network to support autonomous vehicles. As I pointed out to you before, the smart cities and the virtual reality that needed to be demonstrated and shown and could not just be ignored. The early deployments of 5G in the research programs showed it could be done. The telecoms industry typically develops technologies after a long period of time because it has a lot of previous uh, experiences that they cannot just ignore <clears throat> within their own organizations to be able to meet the requirements of the new technology to be deployed. So 6G developed is by no means a quick fix. And like every other generation of wireless technology, it has to be done in a, in a right manner. The 5G developments are still in the early stages. Although it has been introduced and the standard, the first standard was available in 2010, there's still a long way to go. The relationship between 5G and 6G is symbolic. So 5G cannot exist without, sorry, 6G cannot exist without 5G and vice versa. It has to have some kind of a important fixed stable platform before the next generation can be introduced. So if you want to look into what is really 5G, <clears throat> it started right in the middle of what, when 4G revolution was still being developed and still being structured, where the super fast mobile data services were still in its infancy and both coverage and speed capabilities were not available. The technology is capable of offering internet speeds of up to 150 megabits per second. And in some areas through doubling LTE, which is a radio technology that was used in 4G, gave and showed the possibilities of meeting 300 megabits per second. So the question always keeps coming back, why on earth do we need anything more? And this is 4G. So the, the fact that even the fixed line broadband was not fast enough, there was no reason why people should move on to 5G, with the exception, of course, of all the applications and the capabilities that I pointed out to you before. But more important was to have enough of capacity whenever you go to perform every function you wanted to do, drop in speed or connection, no matter how many people are connected at the same time. 5G was to run on a new high spectrum band in comparison to 2G and 3G before that. The new band <clears throat> will be much less uh, congested in compared 
to whatever was done previously. However, signals would be able to travel as far, not, not so far, and that's why it was important to be able to, to have a certain access or access points closer together and be able to offer the kind of service. So the aim of 5G was to become invisible, sort of a commodity, just like a electricity. It would enable device manufacturers to revise and realize the Internet of Things in every possible way. One of the main benefits of 5G technology over 4G was not to be its speed of delivery, but admittedly could be between 10 gigabits per second or 100 gigabits per second, but not the lat latency. The 4G was capable of between 400 milliseconds and 600 milliseconds, which is low lat latency, but not enough to provide real-time response. Very important for IoT. Multi-user gaming is another example, which required lower latency, but 4G could not quite deliver. So these are reasonings why we had to move to something else. The 5G perspectives could range between one millisecond and 10 milliseconds. This would allow, for example, a prospector in a, in a football stadium to watch a live stream of alternative camera angle of the action and the matches, what is going on on the pitch ahead and to pre receivable the without any perceivable delays. The capacity was an important factor as well. With the Internet of Things becoming more and more important over time, it was important to have these features all available. So the initial idea behind 5G was an infrastructure that could be put in place to avoid anything that could not meet the demands. And many of us heard in many presentations and many talks about the 50 billion connected devices around the world. These can range between existing technologies such as smartphones, tablets, uh, smart watches, refrigerators, cars. We've heard all of the stories before, but we haven't really, we did not see it really be put into place. As part of the heterogeneous network, the points or cells to be still used could still be done by LTE, advanced, which was 4G, and could not be and could be then connected to a 5G architectural type of network. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. yeah this, this slide is frozen again. <laughs> it's frozen? Try to Yes, try to put another one so we can. Okay. Okay, now, this... now, yes, now it's okay. I apologize for this. I don't really That's know. Okay, no problem. okay so <clears throat> the challenges and the promises is what I'm talking about. And basically, what we're seeing here is um, the promise of 5G was an open wireless network system integrating. Uh, most of the components that, that were available on, on 4G, but with a new radio and bringing in new components into the whole network that did not exist before. They had a particular vision that was set up to meet in a triangular way a certain capability for, uh, for different services that were especially needed in the broadband environment. But to, in order to get there, there were certain radio capabilities that need to be met. And some of these were had to be put through a network type of a slicing uh, facility, virtualization, 
front hall, uh, transmission capabilities, and the edge computing. And of course, the cloud was brought in very quickly. So if we look at what was had to be done in terms of strategy to achieve all of this, they had to have a transformation to 5G. So a concept was set up with a lot of possibilities and opportunities how to move from an existing network to a future network and still be able then to, to evolve or to further develop into 5G or whatever came afterwards. <clears throat> a lot of investments have been done in terms of the optical networks. It was found that the transport network had to have all the capabilities and possibilities of delivering the right type of a service. So the standardization body came up with a 5G architecture reference model. And in this slide here, you can see the radio access networks, which is the RAN on the far left-hand corner with all the transport capabilities that was required, the front hall and the back hall, the fiber and the, the WDMs that were needed in between to go to the next part of the network, the UTRAN, and then to the core network. And as you can see, the core network is not the classical switches that used to be before in 3G. It had involved over the packet capabilities in, in 4G onto a new network structure that, that set up the basis for 5G. Of course, very important all along the way was to fulfill the requirements that were needed before. Intensive studies in research, in standardization, and in the industry were made to meet and, well, to define and meet certain KPIs. And these needed to be put into place and then deployed. This slide shows you a, a traffic model of the 5G network, really moving from one end to the other and the different technologies that were needed to really put this into place. But it's also important to understand whatever we have here is not enough if we move to the next generation of networks because of the, there will be even further demands and requirements for a more higher bandwidth capability. So <clears throat> both the fixed network and the network elements have to go side by side to be able to meet all of these requirements. Now, why I'm saying this is because, as I pointed out to you at the beginning, up to the fifth generation or fourth generation, most of it was just hardware. It was hardware upgrades. It was hardware being deployed giving you the next service, giving you the next capabilities. When we came to 5G, there was software all of a sudden, software structures, because you had SDNs, you had uh, network virtualization, you had the slicing capabilities, and with that, you could do a number of additional things, and the, the edge computing was extremely important. But this would get, get us nowhere if we didn't have the necessary devices. So the devices always come later on. Very unfortunately, the standards, the networks, the structures, infrastructures are first developed and put into place. And then the devices come in because it's very expensive to really put it into little silicon chips and be able to get these down to a factor that the user would accept. So in this slide, I picked up a few of these devices that are available for 5G today. And 5G has not been fully implemented. It has in many countries around the world, but it's the very first release of phase one of 5G. So 
Qualcomm came with a very aggressive uh, program where they developed an X50 modem, is what they called it. The new chip would be capable <clears throat> of download speeds up to five gigabits per second, 400 times faster than what the current average 4G download speeds were. The smartphone manufacturers received samples of this chip by the end of 2017 to implement in their devices. This gave it a big push forward. It helped many of these manufacturers to come out with devices much quicker than what would have expected. However, <clears throat> there are some of the manufacturers and operators such as Telstar in Australia that just carried on on LTE developments. Of course, LTE was not going to stop when, when 5G started. It would have just been carried on. So there are two parallel routes on the same track. The first gigabyte LTE download speeds were delivered in Sydney using a X16 modem and Netgear's Nighthawk M1, I think it's called. So it shocked some of the manufacturers that on LTE, you could achieve something even more than what they were doing with 5G because it was using a LTE type of a radio uh, access and then a new core. But we also have the new 5G radio network. Sad to say that although we have a number of these devices already on the market, and some of them are the low cost terminals, there are a few of these manufacturers that have been put very bad into the press. Four of them have been found to have cyber, uh, key cyber security risk and have been identified with three 5G phones Apparently, one of them linked to pre-installed apps and others, other two would link a uh, risk of losing personal data, possibly restrictions on freedom of expression. This pushes it back again. Nevertheless, we all hope there's all these trade wars and all these big uh, political issues get solved and we can move on. This is not what we need. We need something to look forward to. So if we look at <clears throat> some of the advantages of 5G, and now I've taken a jump to the phase two, release 18. The re releases are all the different standard releases. 17 was the first phase. 18 was the second phase, because whatever could not be completed and fulfilled in the first phase was pushed on to the second phase. This shows that LTE, <clears throat> as they called it, the advanced 5G, later on, which was then evolving, was also going to open the path to 6G and open the path to private networks. The crunch that other business sectors were seeing was going to be solved with uh, with 5G uh, phase two. So these network designs featuring the edge and the cloud computing have only recently started the full deployment. New radio designs that support the technologies between full duplex communications have been introduced. Re silent technologies that block hacks and other threats very important risk factors. Artificial intelligence and the man machining technologies have now been put in place. They haven't been fully completed, but it doesn't mean that they're not good enough. They have reached an extent where they will carry on. Coordinated spectrum sharing techniques have been introduced, and the services that merge the physical and digital worlds will be fulfilled. This has given it a major drive forward. And the technology and the IC components manufacturers have become very aggressive and just waiting to be challenged. 
<coughs> so if you look at the market, because a lot of people questioned this and said, you didn't fulfill this before, so what are you going to do in the future? And there, of course, the marketing industry have come up with predictive numbers and uh, that look very good <clears throat> and very high, in fact, for the private sector of using the 5G technology and infrastructure. So there is a possibility of this by 2025 of going up to roughly 600 billion US dollars, depending on how it's introduced, how it's done, and the way the business plans go. Of course, it has hit a number of money, uh, sorry, number of the industry players quite hard because of the pandemic situation that we had in the last two years. But this is not the end. <clears throat> Whatever could not be fulfilled in 5G and the standard of 5G had always the support of 6G. So there will be a 6G. And the 6G has to deliver more than the 5G. The use of highest frequencies, higher than 5G networks, and provide substantial high capacity and much lower latency than we had in 5G has to be accomplished. One of the goals of 6G, internet to be supported, should has to, has to be one millisecond latency communication. This is 1,000 times faster, or one one thousandth of the latency than one millisecond throughput. <coughs> the 6G technology market is expected to facilitate large improvements in imaging, presence technology, and location awareness. Working in conjunction with artificial intelligence, the computerization infrastructure of 6G would autonomously determine the best location of computing to occur because artificial in intelligence will determine the spots and where infrastructure is required. And this would include decision making for data storage, processing, and sharing. Very close to what I've shown you in the previous slide in private environments, so enterprise environments, etc. 6G is expected to support data rates of one terabytes per second. Access points will be able to serve multiple clients simultaneously. The level of capacity and latency will extend the performance of 5G applications and they extend the scope of capabilities to support innovative applications in wireless co uh, connectivity, censoring and imaging, just like we heard before from Oswaldo's presentation. It's a good point. There's a lot of future to move in that direction. On the edge point of the network, we will see a lot of new things happening. The internet is expected to, to launch commercially. Uh, sorry, the 6G internet is expected to launch commercially in 2030. There's still a long way to go, but we also need a distributed radio access network that will work in the tera <coughs> terahertz spectrum to increase the capacity, low latency, and improve spectrum sharing. In, while in some early discussions, this has taken place, and a lot of 6G requirements have been put together, work has already been started. There's a whole lot of uh, K KPIs that have been defined, have been <clears throat> specified, and people are working on this right now. So there's research going on around the whole world. Most of the work is considered into the architectural environment, which is which really encompasses all the building blocks of the 6G network. So most of the component, components that, will be, that have been introduced in 5G architecture will still 
be around in 60. But what will become much more stronger is the artificial intelligence and some of the new components that will be required for the 6G capabilities. To show you some of these points without going into all the details, you can see around this, I call it the globe of 6G. The sixth generation of cellular networks will integrate a set of previous disparted technologies, including deep learning and big data analysis. Some of you might remember with us, I think, 10 years ago, I worked on some of these big data analysis programs and projects, but we didn't know what to do with it and where it would go. It's now coming into importance. <coughs> so 6G, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> will bring the... <coughs> terabit per second speed. Then it'll be, it'll be used in the, in the terahertz signal transmission. The IO core networking will be important and definitely the microsecond latency. Artificial intelligence powered network management. So there'll be a lot of automation into the network. And the industry and use case driven standardization is already on its way. <clears throat> Short range communications and experience network will definitely be a major point for 6G. <clears throat> what we can see here is <clears throat> a very strong need for security, privacy, and trust challenges for 6G. 5G met a number of these requirements, but they were no better than what we had in the previous infrastructures that we are well familiar with. The additional challenges that need to be addressed were listed down and definitely since the network will be used as an ambiguous sensor blurring the lines between the physical and the digital world. It will be more important to have security, privacy, and some of the trust uh, features more intensively looked at. To address all of these concerns, the level of trust, privacy, and security in 6G has to be significantly higher than the current state of the art in today's data networks, which necessitates <clears throat> research in many different areas. Just to give you an idea of what, I, what I'm talking about. Challenges in trusted networks are still not completely there. The openness of the internet and the lack of enforceable regulation needs to be tangled. Scalability across heterogeneous devices and heterogeneous users patterns or heterogeneous network types and the clouds open out many different questions. Trust management across multiple domains, including the adaptation of zero trust technologies needs to be implemented. Building of software with few ideas in organism across the entire value chain has not been defined. So as we can see here, these are just some examples, but there's a lot of open space here <clears throat> for researchers to come up with new bright ideas and for it to be implemented in standardization and then into the whole network. Challenges in new network architectures have to be addressed. These are challenges that come in as we move on. We heard in the previous presentation, the challenges in a post-quantum world is extremely important. Some of the uh, quantum safe encryption algorithms need to be defined, researched, and implemented. Software and uh, artificial intelligence define security. 
cannot be ignored. A number of things have been put in place, tools have been put in place, but it's not enough. The increase in the cloud computing and offloading functionality to the clouds introduces security threats related to data confidentiality, data integrity, platform integrity, and user privacy. We don't have a solution for that. Then if we look at the challenges at the physical security layer, there is still a lot of work to be done in this particular area. And so on. So the list gets longer and longer. <clears throat> There's also challenges of the privacy protection. We have privacy laws, especially in Europe. In the EU, they're very stringent and very strong in a lot of senses. But the networks on certain levels need to have mechanisms and capabilities of also <clears throat> looking into privacy environments. So there's a whole lot of things that need to be really looked at. Then if we come to the breakthrough that are needed to make 6 year a reality, then we start thinking of different blocks. So rethinking the seamless networks through the technical in, uh, innovation. 6 year requires major innovations across wireless connectivity. The artificial intelligence networks, devices, Circuit technologies and distributed intelligence computing needs to be taken into consideration. 6G is supposed to encompass all the technologies and offer a very high integration as far as possible. Some of the, the transport network was already integrated in 5G, in, well, 4G and as well as in 5G. Here, there has to be a complete new set of components that takes this forward. We will nevertheless still have a new generation of radio technology. Some of the other, all of these different networks and, then, and technologies that have been introduced have always had a new radio capability. This has pushed it forward, but the requirements justify why these have been needed. We need to create new global standards, industry standards. We're doing it. We have three GPPs, I, ITU, etc. all of these different standards in place. But there are indications of political problems. Especially we look at what happened a few years ago with the trade problems between the US and China, where China threatened to have its own standardization capabilities in India, uh, sorry, in, in China. If this had to go through, or this would go through, all of, a all of a sudden, we'd have a divergence of standards. In most other regions, 5G and then 6G in Asia, this would not help to meet the global uh, profitability of 6G. Taking a proactive approach to cybersecurity would be lost. And we need this right across the whole globe. We're offering network infrastructure. And with network infrastructure and what's required in the future, we need to take all of this into consideration. Driving trends and performances need to be considered. It's not going to stop. It will still carry on. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Enabling innovation, accessibility, and the safety through policy. Once again, policy have to be put in place. Empowering the next generation of engineers. All of the researchers out there need to be educated, need to be given more freedom to be able to open out their minds and come up with new ideas. These ideas have to be accepted in the research programs and taken forward. If that is not the case, we'll be led by industry again. Standardization, extremely important. If we look at the milestones that we have here, not to go right through the whole slide and show you what happened in the past, but just look at the future. Uh, I pointed out to you before that we would still have evolution of the current technologies. So although we would be expecting a 6G around 2030, 
uh, in release 19, we'll still have the continuation of 5G evolution. And the, uh, the parallel to that, there's work being done to develop and create a new 6G standard. Something that's hitting us very hard, and I think we're all becoming very conscious of this, is the energy consumption. This is extremely important. We need to take this into consideration in a new standard, a new infrastructure that we are developing for the future. There's a lot of technologies around there that need to be integrated, investigated, into, integrated to meet the needs of all the, the emission thresholds that are being put to rest by all the greens, the green parties, the youngsters, to protect our own environment. And we all know, as researchers and engineers, that uh, power consumption has been very high in most of telecoms or wireless networks and data networks and needs to be tremendously reduced. Has been done. I'm not saying there was nothing done. It has been done, but that is still not enough. And we need to take care of this. But then if we look at our future, that looks very bright to us. 6G is on its way. It's not a question anymore whether it's going to be another G or, or whether it's something totally new. It cannot be something totally new because you need a basis to build on. And all the investments that will come from network operators will be based on whatever exists and then whatever comes in the future. So one thing is very clear that 6G will utilize increasingly high frequency RF bands that will require as um, a new development RF filter uh, resonators. And without this RF filters, the performance promised by 6G will not be attained. And we know that today. So we need to do something about it. We need to look into it. We need to research a little more. And there is still time to make sure that this is accepted in the standardization environment because we're looking at the last possibility, which is close for 2030, when IMT, that's the, U uh, the International Telecommunications Union um, evaluation, and uh, the standard and the requirements for spectrum will be allocated. So the 6G network and infrastructure is going to be the communication networks, which will be flexible, smart, and ambiguous. And that is our vision. That is our goal. What we need to do is really try and define and look into the open issues that are still needed for research. So some of the open issues really are around the decentralization operating systems for ambiguous computing. We still need to do a lot of work here. In view of the IOE application scenarios envisioned in 6G, it will be necessary to develop a decentralized operating system for a dynamic, autonomous, and collaborative network, which can efficiently enable peer-to-peer -peer communications, decentralized data storage and access on demand, service migration, and develop a flexible adaptation of heterogeneous devices, such as servers, uh, mobile phones, TV sets, whatever is required. Another area that's important is collective decision-making by decentralization, artificial intelligence. Extremely important. Once again, artificial intelligence is becoming more and more implemented in these networks. And to give you another example is the distributive influence of the, de of the decentralization network and the service model. Something that 
needs to be taken into consideration, especially when it comes to the business models, the products, the services, and the ecosystem rolled in the future network. We are expecting that we will have, at some period of time, a new internet environment, a new internet, perhaps, platform. We don't know. But people are having thoughts about this. So to a large extent, all the work that we're doing today will not be lost. It will be taken off, taken over in the future, whatever comes in towards the next environment. So just to give you a little teaser, we're just thinking about what's going to come after 6G, 7G? Is this another G? Or whether it's going to deliver something new? Data up to 46 gigabits per second, nearly five times the rate of 6G? Will it then deliver double the size of the channel to 320 megahertz and afford 16 spatial streams compared to, <clears throat> to eight in 6G? So we're looking at five times some of the characteristics and some of the features that we're already defining for 6G in 2030. What about stepping away from the paradigm of speed and looking then into redefining the capabilities of 6G? We haven't even completely got there. But there are people already doing this because questions are coming up all over. I pointed out to you the cyber physical fusion. Very important. Can a lot of these technologies and requirements be integrated up front? Texting. People want to go to space and people are flying to space. Can they text from space, out of space, back to Earth? Some of it can be done today. How can we improve this? There are a lot of researchers working on these kind of solutions. And of course, the quantum leap and end of the 6G, will that happen? I'm not too sure about that because I've heard some rumors and I've heard people talk about an 8G in 2050. So the Gs are not going to stop. We have to be just be careful how they're put in what context to be able to meet a society and a world that's looking out towards its capabilities. And with that, I'd like to thank you. And I do apologize for all the, the problems we've had, but uh, I, I hope at least I've given you a message. Thank you very much, uh, Bosco, for your excellent talk, uh, giving us a, a, a picture of the future in the cell telecommunications. Uh, <coughs> uh, I, I think we have a, a few questions for you. Okay. Okay, if you could. Uh, Vicente Angelo de Souza Jr. asks about uh, the open RAN movement. The open uh, RAN, yes. Yeah, the open RAN movement. Okay, yes. The Open RAN uh, Alliance is a group of many smart manufacturers that have really uh, noticed that there could be more uh, possibilities, there could be more freedom to implementation of a lot of additional and good features if a number of the interfaces which are closed or were closed in the past in these uh, radio networks, um, to some extent could be opened up. And they've come up with very good solutions, very good concepts, but there has been a little bit of a once again, political, when it comes to industry, very often political issues come there towards the different regions, uh, west, east, and whatever. 
And uh, that's why it has been tried, or whatever's been available in the 5G environment. But I personally think in 6G, when we start seeing a lot of these other RAN solutions and capabilities being integrated and coming closer together, that's where we, we will see uh, open RAN taking a stronger position. So there okay. will be something towards open RAN. Definitely. Okay, good. Yeah, he, he adds uh, yeah. a sub question. On sure. The first one. Is it a way <clears throat> to move forward a different business model uh, for the telecom market? Uh, will that give you a different? I didn't quite understand the question. Did, will uh, that give you a different this can lead to the, the open ring? Yes, uh, it's a different uh, business model. If this yeah. lead, could lead to a, a different uh, market model for the telecom. I definitely agree with that statement. I think this could lead to, to an absolutely different business model because it opens out a lot of opportunities and uh, restrictions a number of other uh, manufacturers or companies uh, in the past uh, will just drop away and there will be new ideas, new uh, capabilities that, that, that will be introduced. So there will be uh, a new business model. In, in this, in the same uh, line of yeah. thought, uh, he questioned if uh, it's a way uh, to give more flexibility to implement machine learning based solutions. Uh, is it a solid uh, component of 5G to the, the 6G uh, transition? Well, that's already happening. Uh, that's why I didn't mention it. I mean, machine learning has been taking place for some time now. And just, when you just look at the, the structure of, I didn't go deep into the reference model and into the structure because of the few problems I was having to, to carry on with the presentation. But machine learning has been around for some time, already introduced. Uh, people have been using, especially when it comes to AI, so artificial intelligence, and to the management orchestration, it has been around. Uh, we've seen it also to a large extent in the previous standards, like it's 4G with the SON capabilities, uh, which would then look at uh, the network configuration, some of the parameters and whatever's required there, and then automatically tune in and adjust to the right configuration and parameters. So it's been around to a small extent. Well, what we're seeing now is it's becoming stronger and stronger, a key point. And in 6G, it will be definitely a very important integral feature. Uh, when we break up these classical uh, structure models, uh, I pointed out to you, the boxes will disappear and there'll be more software coming in. Then it'll be important to have such machine uh, learning capabilities right across there and to be able to tune in to uh, achieve what we're trying to do. Okay, uh, I like to thank you very much and congratulate you for your very interesting talk. Um, and uh, it, it's good to know uh, from the, the side of the of the enterprise, uh, and you're certainly one of the most qualified person to talk about the view of the enterprise. Uh, regarding the, the, the communications in this area of, uh, of cell phones and, and so on. So uh, thank you very much uh, for your talk. And I invite you and also invite uh, the attendees uh, to the, the panel that you come after this. In, uh, in 15 minutes, we have a panel on, on the application of blockchain uh, applications the blockchain, okay. uh, and thank you very much, uh, Bosco Fernandes, for your excellent talk. Well, thank you as well. 
And once again, my apologies about the technology and I, I, I didn't get it to work right. Never mind. It's good for all of us. It's, it's just... Yes, it's new learning curve. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all for attending the session.